Hello class. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, the concept of sensory perception. Since we're not having class tomorrow, I just thought I would just provide a little bit of information on things we would have discussed in class. And uh, hopefully then you can continue your reading and let me know if you have any questions about anything. Um, think about our senses. Our uh, sensory organs do provide a pathway for stimuli to reach the brain, allowing us to experience the world in which we live. Sensory stimuli give meaning to events in the environment. We use our five senses, vision, hearing, touch, smell, and taste. They're all essential for growth, development, and survival. Think about our senses. Sensory perception is protective. It is also complex, allowing individuals to master activities that require the use of multiple senses at once. So again, as we do with each concept, we look at that uh, continuum uh, for sensory perception function. And we think people that have all their facilities, all their senses, and are functioning at optimal level. And then we look at the opposite end of that spectrum or that continuum and see people that have failing senses. And it doesn't necessarily, you know, pertain to the elderly. We see people that are born with deficits in regards to their senses. People are born blind, people are born deaf, or people end up with some kind of disease that causes blindness or deafness. Or think about our diabetics who uh, develop neuropathies and uh, have a change in their um, sense of uh, feeling or touch. So those things are definitely altered. So when we think of um, you know our sensory perceptions, um, think about those aspects of sensory stimuli that we are more, most concerned with in the healthcare setting. And of course, our biggest one is, is safety. You know, when our, our patients um, cannot see or cannot hear, this could definitely provide an unsafe situation. Um, orientation. Uh, it also makes our patients very vulnerable to um, uncomfortable situations or even unsafe situations if any of their uh, senses uh, are altered or deprived or are lacking in any regards. Uh, because uh, because any time um, our patients are um, in the hospital or anywhere in any healthcare facility, um, it is an unfamiliar environment. So even with all our senses intact, it can be a very um, scary and it can be a very unsafe situation if we're not aware of the deficits in uh, our patient's senses that might um, occur. So as we look, you know, through the reading, um, it's important to understand that uh, with sensory perception, it is a very protective mechanism. Um, for instance, uh, you may sense that uh, as you're taking care of your patients that um, the water that they're going to use for their bath that morning uh, is too hot or that they turned on the hot water tab and you catch them right before they go to wash their hands and uh, you prevent them from burning themselves with uh, too hot of water. Um, so um, there's a situation where maybe the patient you know has definitely an alteration in any of his senses that could have caused him um, harm. Um, and alterations in sensory functions can affect an individual's ability to experience the world. You know, we, we have the sense of hearing and the sense of, of sight. Um, we can go outside and uh, be aware of the um, sounds a bird makes or, um, you know, hear the wind ruffling uh, the, the leaves on the tree. Um, 
it could also um, give us a sign that maybe danger is approaching. Um, we may be trying to cross the street and we could hear, uh, for instance, an ambulance coming down with the uh, loud and very um, vivacious sirens. Um, and maybe that would prevent us from walking across the street and possibly, you know, um, you know, getting injured. So these are things that, uh, you know, um, are things to think about in regards to our patients. And um, with all senses intact, um, it hopefully can provide a person with, you know, the ability to self-care, um, maintain safety, independence, uh, communicate, and have, uh, you know, healthy relationships uh, with others, and particularly with us as, as the nurse. If they are, um, you know, patients in an acute care setting or even in the facility in which you're caring for your uh, residents. And any deficits, such as uh, mild vision impairment, may require only simple compensatory behaviors or assisted devices to overcome it. Maybe all that person really needs is to have eyeglasses available so that they're able to uh, read uh, maybe the permit that they're, that they're willing to sign. Uh, or maybe someone that has a hearing deficit uh, maybe has their um, hearing aid in so that they're able to hear uh, as the doctor's explaining, you know, what their test results came back as. Um, and sometimes, though, our patients are unfortunately um, 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 plagued with um, a deprivation of more than one senses. Maybe they have a problem with their vision as well as their hearing, or maybe they had, um, you know, some kind of problem with their smell. Maybe they, uh, you know, had you know, a tumor or had uh, chemotherapy or something that may have impaired smelling. And this could be another uh, possibility for danger. Um, you know, a person may not smell that a fire has started in their house or there's a gas leak or something like that, which could very much alert them to the possibility of a very serious and dangerous situation that they're involved in. Um, your book talks about normal sensory perception and obviously that sensory reception is the process of receiving stimuli or data and these stimuli are either external or internal to the body. The external ones are like our vision, our hearing, our smell, our touch, and even our taste. And even uh, gustatory stimuli can be internal as well and other uh, types of internal stimuli are kinesthetic and visceral and um, these uh, terms such as kinesthesia refers to the awareness of the position and movement of body parts um, you know for example an individual walking is normally aware of which leg is forward and they have a related sense is called a uh, stereo stereognosis the ability to perceive and understand an object through touch by its size shape and texture um, and that would make very much sense because if we had our patient close their eyes and maybe we um, gave them an object to hold in their hands they might be very well at identifying what that particular object is whether or not it's a, a, a food product or a piece of fruit or vegetable or even an item such as a, a ballpoint pen or a pencil uh, just by feeling and touching they would be able to identify what kind of an object it is. Visceral means of relating to any large organ within the body. Um, visceral organs may produce stimuli that make an individual aware of them. For instance, after you eat, uh, the person internally feels that they have a full stomach. So sensory perception does involve the conscious organization and translation of the data or stimuli into meaningful information. So um, I hope you go ahead and continue to read that and know that um, um, along with these senses, we're kind of um, integrating uh, cranial nerves in their function. And, uh, you know, we have uh, the first cranial nerve, 
all the way through the 12th cranial nerve, and we'll be talking more about that at a later date. Um, many of our uh, patients or people out there do experience an alteration of sensory perception. Um, and, you know, we as nurses um, obviously um, get those experiences um, with a variety of these alterations from the many patients that we're able to care for. Um, and um, these alterations can definitely um, affect patients and patient care in a number of ways. Um, you know, especially when we think about uh, knowing the history behind our patients, uh, we will learn about things like hearing impairments, uh, diseases of the eyes, such as cataracts, glaucoma, or macular degeneration, eye injuries, and as I said before, peripheral neuropathy. Um, and your book talks about the many, you know, alterations and manifestations that we uh, might be able to um, assess with our patients and learn through um, our assessment histories and, um, you know, just continuing to learn more and more about our patients, which makes us um, able to, you know, provide better care to our patients. Your book gives a lot of um, uh, examples of these alterations, such as uh, vertigo, nystagmus, you know, color blindness, um, and it really talks about the prevalence of uh, sensory perception disorders. Um, it said in, in 2012, 15% of adults age 18 and over reported having some difficulty hearing, and men were more likely to have trouble hearing than women. So uh, we get those uh, particular um, statistics and data from the uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, it says of individuals age 45 to 54, approximately 2% have dis disabling hearing loss. This increases to 8.5% in individuals um, age 55 to 64 and 25% individuals age 65 to 74. And of course, as we start aging, uh, these problems become more prevalent in about 50% in individuals uh, over 80, uh, over 75%. So you can see that this is a, 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 a concept worth talking about when we discuss uh, sensory uh, perceptions. Um, the chart on your uh, in your book on page 1384 really talks about the different alterations uh, such as eye injuries, cataracts, glaucoma, and then age-related macular degeneration, hearing impairment, and peripheral neuropathies. Um, and, and, and it's important too to look at genetic considerations and risk factors. Obviously, um, depending on what type of profession uh, somebody has, um, it's very important that we teach people about safety and wearing uh, the all-important um, uh, protective equipment, uh, you know, uh, such as uh, any anything that would, you know, deflect and um, injure the eyes um, would be necessary for a person to wear uh, vision protective glasses to prevent any type of um, eye injuries or if they're working around uh, machinery that's very loud it would be important to wear uh, earbuds to protect uh, the hearing so later on someone would not suffer from um, hearing loss. Uh, there's also um, genetic predisposition to illnesses and the pathology of certain coexisting disorder, disorders that can also lead to alterations in sensory perception, uh, some congenital and hereditary um, conditions that might be um, brought on from uh, parent to child. Um, again, uh, referring back to uh, culture and diversity, um, there is a, a, a a high incidence of blindness that affects African Americans more than um, often than Caucasians and Hispanics. Um, again, with uh, glaucoma and cataracts are more serious problems within the African American community and can to lead to blindness. So your book talks about things like that. So certain cultures 
are more prone to these um, alterations in the senses, uh, depending on you know what ethnic uh, background that they come from. And then, um, you know, many of the chronic illnesses that our patients are suffering from, especially things like atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis, which may restrict blood flow to the receptor organs in the brain, may also decrease awareness and slow responses down. Um, hypertension is, is a perfect example where it can, um, if it's not controlled, uh, contribute to vision loss and can also... Um, you know, um, cause other issues down the road. Um, people that have um, cardiovascular disease and may suffer like a uh, CVA, it, that can also cause blindness, hearing loss, and definitely affect changes in taste or smell. And the reason for that is probably cause the, because of the uh, effect it has on the cranial nerves, which, um, you know, I mentioned to you earlier, kind of overlap in regards to why we um, have certain um, um, perceptions and why we are able to perceive smells and sight and hearing due to the fact that our cranial nerves are intact and are healthy. A diabetes is one that really can alter a lot of these uh, senses because of the damage uncontrolled blood glucose can do to a person over time. Um, Again, the best way to hopefully prevent alterations in uh, sensory perceptions is to um, promote um, healthy uh, lifestyles that um, protect, um, you know, these uh, senses, which obviously we need throughout a lifetime. Um, and again, uh, what's important too is in regards to health promotion, uh, by continuously and promoting and incorporating environmental stimuli that can provide appropriate sensory input uh, that varies and is either not too excessive or not too limited. Okay. Um, uh, your book talks about how nurses can teach parents to stimulate infants and children and teach family members to stimulate an older adult and other, others in the home uh, who have sensory deficits. So uh, just, uh, you know, encouraging uh, screening, um, especially with, uh, you know, hearing and vision. And I think uh, most of us who have had children uh, begin that process after a infant is born and take them to their uh, regular well um, child uh, checkups to see if um, you know growth and development not only physical growth but also the, the development of these senses are um, progressing uh, at a normal rate and that there's no alterations in any of these uh, assessments also with uh, taste smell and touch um, Again, um, involving a patient in a, a nurse patient interview, asking questions about their visual health, their auditory health, their gustatory health, um, you know, asking them things like, are there any changes in taste, um, olfactory, tactile, and kinesthetic uh, type of things, along with a mental status examination and thinking about what patients, knowing uh, more about their history, um, which put people at a higher risk of uh, developing these uh, sensory um, alterations, okay? Um, thinking about um, a patient's environment, uh, because sometimes uh, people are uh, living in... Um, in an inadequate environmental area that produces very little stimuli, stimuli that really does place a patient at risk for sensory deprivation. Um, along with excessive stimulation that may increase the risk for sensory overload. Um, again, uh, the important thing to remember is uh, a patient's social support network, the degree of isolation 
uh, an individual feels is significantly influenced by the quality and quantity of support from family members and friends. Um, and we can kind of um, assess our patients when we see signs of social deprivation, which may include withdrawal from contact with others to avoid embarrassment or to avoid a dependency on others, um, which can lead to uh, negative self-image, reports of lack of meaningful communication with others, and absence of opportunities to discuss fears or concerns that can facilitate our, their coping mechanisms. Again, physical exam along with eye and vision assessment. Um, and then um, continuing uh, with that, um, we will, uh, you know, um, continue looking at um, assessment of the uh, ears, uh, the nose, the mouth, the neck, the face, and the skull. You will be practicing uh, this assessment in lab on Wednesday. I will demonstrate this whole facial and skull uh, assessment, which is going to include the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and the ears and the neck. Um, and so um, I'll ask for a volunteer um, in uh, my lab as well as your other labs and uh, you will see your lab instructor demonstrate um, an assessment uh, with the face and the skull including all the senses and then um, hopefully we'll have time for you to uh, practice the same assessment on your um, lab partner. This will begin the process of um, demonstrating how we begin uh, that all-important uh, competency of a head-to-toe assessment. Um, and again, we're going to take each system one by one, and uh, there is a video in week three that um, I would ask that you um, look at. Um, before your lab on Wednesday. Um, it's the head, the eyes, and the ears um, examination. I've also um, included a Pearson video. It's just very short. It's about three and a half minutes long. It's the head, the neck, and the lymphatics. And then um, uh, there is that article that uh, I would like you to definitely read before lab about, uh, um, you know, as we age, what occurs uh, with our senses and you'll find some of the information very very astonishing about uh, how things change significantly uh, the older we get part of that normal aging process um, it's important too that as we look at uh, sensory perceptions um, we um, provide um, interventions um, that prevent sensory overload. Um, the patients who are at risk of overstimulation nursing should assist with reducing the number and types of environmental stimuli. Nurses uh, have that ability to counteract sensory overload by blocking stimuli and by helping the patients organize the stimuli and alter responses to the stimuli. Um, for instance, you know, just having a patient wear dark glasses with a UVA uh, light protection can partially block light rays, or even a window shade or a curtain can reduce visual stimulation. Um, Earplugs can reduce auditory stimuli or do soft background music uh, and earphones. Um, those are just a few examples. Um, sometimes the sounds of their environment can be really very overstimulating, such as the uh, alarm on a, on a pump. Maybe the patient is receiving some kind of medication or IV fluids and the uh, pump alarms continuously go off. Um, it might be a good time to also, uh, if the patient seems just over anxious and overstimulated, 
that the nurse at that time can employ relaxation techniques to reduce anxiety and stress despite continual sensory stipulation. And then we can look the other way about preventing sensory deprivation. You know, really offering our patients newspapers, books, music, and television to simulate those visual and auditory senses. Uh, sometimes objects that are very pleasant to touch, including soft fabrics, can provide tactile stimulation. Sometimes just a very soft and fluffy blanket where the patient, uh, you know, just can constantly uh, touch that may just really keep them stimulated enough that it may relax them to be able to sleep even better. Um, clocks that use a color to differentiate night from day can help orient patients to time and fresh flowers or a fragrant plant can also stimulate the olfactory sense that might just bring memories of maybe their own garden at their home just to make their surroundings a little bit more pleasant to be in um, and then you know if our patients do have uh, acute sensory def deficits um, we might want to uh, encourage the use of sensory aids to support residual sensory function, promoting the use of other senses, communicating effectively, and ensuring patient safety. Um, there's all kinds of things like sensory aids um, that we can provide with our patients. Sometimes service dogs are very popular um, that uh, uh, really uh, stimulate the patient and really can provide a very therapeutic effect with uh, the patient. Um, they can, um, you know, be expensive, but maybe that is just uh, what a particular patient may need. Uh, your book talks about a lot of sensory aids for visual and hearing deficits and also talks about uh, the communication with patients who have a visual or hearing deficit um, and really ways in which we can promote the use of other senses, uh, other senses in case one is definitely deprived or is faltering. Um, again communicating effectively and how do our patients c cope when they've learned that or are aware that they have some kind of alteration in some of their senses uh, vision hearing um, and impaired tactile sense um, some of the collaborative theories therapies that we may uh, use with patients with sensory alterations is um, Obviously, uh, that will depend very much on the cause and severity of the problem. Um, sometimes for patients that might have visual problems or visual disorders, patients may be referred to an optometrist or an ophthalmologist. And uh, maybe um, there can be um, some corrective lenses prescribed for the patient. Um, or maybe if it... Um, it's a very serious situation. Maybe that patient may uh, benefit from uh, some type of surgical procedure or some kind of advanced treatment. Um, sometimes for hearing disorders, disorders, a audiologist may be called in to provide hearing exams and provide that prescription for hearing aids. Uh, sometimes people have been reluctant to get those due to uh, they might be embarrassed or maybe just the cost of such a, 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 a apparatus to help a person uh, hear better. Uh, uh, you might also want to um, think about patients who are uh, have a new or a permanent hearing loss. Maybe they might be referred to uh, to a class in which they would learn uh, American Sign Language or even um, learning about lip reading. So those are things that we can make our patient more comfortable uh, when they do experience some of these deficits. Um, again, surgery and maybe some of the pharmacological therapy, which I'm not going to go into right now, but um, you want to consider uh, lifespans, you know, sensory perception in infants uh, as well as children. Also, sensory perception in, you know, pregnant women as well as sensory perception in older adults. You might want to pay very close attention to that particular category in regards to the types of patients right now that you're caring for. Uh, what kind of things would you, um, you know, foresee um, assessing in the um, residencies where you're taking care of the patients right now in Nursing 100? 
Uh, just to kind of remind you, uh, the required reading in your Health and Physical Assessment Nursing Book by Barbarito, um, there's various patches of assigned reading, and those are just um, reviewing the assessment of when we, uh, you know, look at the face and assess the hearing and the eyes and the hair and um, the various um, eye exams that we do to assess vision uh, far away as well as close up by the various um, eye tests that we perform. And um, we're going to show you those in lab, things like the Snelling chart, which you're probably very familiar with, probably have had those types of exams at school or also, you know, with your own um, ophthalmologist. Um, we're going to also be looking at uh, YouTube videos on how to remove contact lenses and removing, cleaning, and inserting a hearing aid and then um, looking at the advantages and disadvantages of different hearing aid styles and just um, a YouTube video link on how to care for your glasses, okay? Um, from the missed uh, lecture this week on Monday, um, there's just a, uh, a short little uh, case study and it involves a 10-year-old, uh, Simone Thompson. Uh, is a 10 year old uh, or Simon I'm sorry Simon Thompson is a 10 year old Caucasian male who is currently in the fifth grade uh, he's always been a good student but this year his grades have been very good and during a parent teacher conference uh, Simon's teacher reported that he seemed to be squinting a lot and his parents scheduled an appointment with their primary care providers office and the nurse practitioner tests Simon's vision using a Snelling chart and based on her findings she advises Simon's parents to take him to see an ophthalmologist. And the ophthalmologist determines that Simon's visual acuity is 2100 and that he needs glasses to correct his vision. When he starts wearing glasses, his 13 year old sister and her friends tease Simon every chance they can, and he becomes embarrassed at having to wear his glasses. Um, and so, saying that, especially when. Um, the ophthalmologist assessed his visual acuity as 20 to 20 over 100. Um, it's important to know what does that kind of a, a test result mean. And those, were, those are the things that we're going to look at when we do an actual Snelling test, hopefully uh, uh, in lab on Wednesday. So, um, and then um, that's the role of the registered nurse in assessing sensory perception. Um, interviewing about the problem, just kind of getting a little history as to maybe why the patient came uh, to the physician to have his eyes tested. Was it just a, uh, a yearly routine or is the uh, patient having problems? And of course with this young boy, uh, the 10 year old, he definitely was. He was squinting in school and obviously didn't say anything to his parents and it was only discovered by his parents from the uh, parent-teacher conference. Um, There's also uh, things along with the um, Snelling chart or the E-chart uh, can also be used. There's called what we call a Rosenbaum, uh, which um, is just a little card where we can actually assess that close-up or that near vision. And then um, we can also, um, you know, see how our role as the registered nurse changes in different care settings. Uh, nurses in specialized settings may be trained to do more with advanced procedures. For example, they may be able to test for intraocular pressure. Um, and, you know, think about this young boy. Um, if we're talking about, you know, uh, finding out exactly what his difficulties are, um, we might want to ask uh, Simon more about his vision, um, you know, how is he seeing at night? Um, you know, um, how would you rate your vision? All these things to give us a little bit more idea of what is occurring with him. And you always want to be sure that you ask questions that would be appropriate, uh, appropriate based on uh, on the person's age and his development. Um, so, uh, given Simon's visual acuity of twenty a uh, hundred, uh, you want to think about what condition he most likely demonstrates. So I'm not going to give that answer away and that's what I hope you can um, uh, figure out and 
critically decide as to what his um, problem is. So that's just an example that we would have talked about um, in our class. And then um, what's important too is uh, I want you to read uh, that article. I have downloaded that in um, week three in your Canvas course, your Nursing 100 Canvas course, and the name of the article is Making Sense of Sensory Loss as We Age. And um, the article lists the following class, classic five senses in sensory perception, and you might want to discuss how each sense contributes to nor normal development for each age group. When we talk about the infant, the toddler, the school age, the adolescents, the young adult, the adult, and the older adult. And I think it's important to think about how important these senses are and how difficult it is for our patients or even our family members um, to go through life when they are starting to develop these uh, alterations. And um, Kemet and Brotherson from 2015 stated, image not being able to see a beautiful sunset or hear your grandchildren playing or smell your favorite flowers these losses affect people in different ways. The impact of these losses can lead to social isolation, loneliness, and feelings of depression. And you want to think of an example of how, uh, you know, each sense can lead to social isolation, loneliness, or feelings of depression in the older adult. So think about that. You might want to uh, just kind of, uh, you know, decide, you know, why would someone who can't see uh, feel any of those very um, sad life experiences. Um, and then the important thing too is what strategies do these authors suggest to help cope with these sensory deficits? So if a person has visual problems, what would they suggest to an older patient to have them not feel so deprived or to help uh, better equip them to see. Um, an example would be maybe uh, read in an area that's more lighted. Um, and the same thing goes for hearing. Maybe um, if they're watching TV, uh, make sure that there's not a lot of, um, uh, you know, background noise, okay? So that's kind of the things I want you to think about. And then again, I, I, I went over some of those uh, terms, uh, kinesthetic, uh, stereognosis, visceral, and proprioception. Uh, and thinking about, um, you know, how vertigo and colorblindness can really um, cause problems with daily life in these different age groups that we're talking about. And then if you look at those, um, uh, that chart that I said uh, was in your book uh, regarding cranial nerves, you'll notice that uh, the cranial nerves um, are either a sensory, a motor, or some of them are both sensory and motor nerves, and I just wanted you to kind of determine uh, when you talk about cranial nerve one, is that sensory, motor, motor, is it a combination of both? So that is another um, uh, activity I would have liked to have gone over with you. Um, again, uh, looking at that YouTube video on advantages and disadvantages of different hearing styles, and then um, kind of looking at which one um, you know, makes the other one look different. So, um, and then just about contact lenses, because it's important to know that your patients do have contact lenses, um, so that if they go for a certain procedure or even surgery, that they're taking them out, and that we are uh, providing um, a good care in a secure location for those, so that they can put them back in uh, when they um, come back from whatever procedure they had. And I always suggest too when people do have uh, contact lenses that they bring in a, um, a pair of glasses just in case something would happen to those contact lenses. You would want to have the patient have eyeglasses so they're able to see. Um, I would also like you to refer to uh, page 302 in your Barbarita book. And at the bottom of that page is a patient-centered interaction with a lady named Sophia Rodriguez, Rodriguez, 
Rodriguez. Uh, she's a 62-year-old Mexican immigrant. And uh, I just want you to kind of read through that. It's very short. And um, I want you to kind of think in your own mind uh, what kind of interview questions you felt should have been included and why. Um, and then look at the analysis at the end of the um, interview and think about which content from the assessment was used to help you apply your learning and you can give a couple examples that might be very helpful to you. Um, there's also another YouTube link about living with vision a loss um, and um, you know um, things like that. So. Um, I hope this is helping to kind of review things that we weren't able to go over um, um, yet, um, tomorrow. Um, another thing that um, I just wanted to bring to your attention is um, a lot of people as they age do start becoming aware of the fact that, uh, you know, they're starting to see or hear. Uh, uh, they, they're, they're more aware of the alterations that are occurring. Um, there's an example here of a, um, a scenario where we have a, uh, a Mr. Harris. He's only 61. He's an African-American man. He's in the adult medicine clinic for a routine physical exam. His temp is fine. It's 37 degrees Celsius. His pulse is 86, respiration 16. And his blood pressure is 118 over 68. And upon receiving documentation from his last annual assessment, the nurse notes that Mr. Harris takes a blood pressure medication and a cholesterol-lowering agent. The patient previously uh, worked as a janitor for the school system, and now he is a school bus uh, driver. He has a five-year history of glaucoma for which he uses eye drops. And today he states that his vision seems worse than usual. Now think about what his occupation is. So of course, what's your biggest concern? And so uh, that seems to be quite obvious that obvious that he cannot see very well today and he's out driving a school bus. So really it's about his safety, safety of the children on that bus and all the people that are on the road when he's on the road. Is he seeing the... The, 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 the lights? Is he seeing the stop sign? Would he be able to um, see somebody crossing, crossing the street and be able to stop accordingly? Um, and of course he does admit that his vision is getting worse. So that is really uh, the biggest concern with this particular um, scenario. But you have to look at the positive side of this. Uh, the patient is uh, doing something right. Um, he's um, using the healthcare system. He's uh, taking his medications for his blood pressure, and he's doing something about his high cholesterol level. Um, and so, you know, you might want to know, um, you know, has there been any change in his healthcare management? Um, and uh, you know, maybe the glaucoma is getting worse, or maybe there could be another visual problem that's occurring that is um, something more than just glaucoma. So um, those are the kind of things that we hope um, patients can be aware of and that they admit when they have um, you know, this alteration occurring, especially when it involves the safety of themselves and other people, especially when it involves their occupation. Um, so uh, there's a little dialogue between the nurse and this Mr. Harris. And um, we do see that uh, glaucoma can be more common in people with high blood pressure and cholesterol. And of course, he's also African American, which puts him more at risk. And um, but it looks like um, uh, he's taking his medications because his blood pressure seems to be under really, really good control. And it's always good to uh, that patients who come in for these checkups have the list of their medications that they're on or else bring in an example of those medications so that we can be sure that uh, the patient is taking those correctly and that the nurse is aware of exactly what medications the present patient is um, you know presently on. So uh, that was just a, a little bit of information and um, of course when um, the nurse would probably do some type of assessment on this patient and uh, uh, and what she found to be was that the um, 
uh, external eyes sy symmetrical and no ptosis. And hopefully you know what ptosis is. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's spelled P-T-O-S-I-S. Um, and the PERLA exam, which is a acronym for Pupils Equal Round Reactive Light and Accommodation. And we'll learn more about that when we do the assessment on Wednesday. And hopefully you're doing your reading in your Barbarita book and to understand exactly what your responsibility is when you assess uh, the vision of your patients, okay, doing that eye assessment. Um, and the other acronym is EOMI, and that stands for Extra Ocular Movements Intact. And that will also uh, be demonstrated what that actually means, what kind of uh, movements we would want the patient to perform in order to say that his extraocular movements are intact. Uh, his conjunctiva is clear, sclera is white, and his distance vision, the right is 2030 and the left is 2050. And I'm not going to tell you what that actually means. I want you to be able to determine that from your readings and, and analyze that when you get some kind of data back such as that, what does that mean about your patient? And palpation, external eye lacrimal apparatus without swelling or redness, non-tender. Um, so I guess my question is, with all that information that I provided you, uh, how did you interpret Mr. Harris's visual uh, acuity? And again, looking at any terms that you really don't know the meaning, but I'm saying we're going to go over this in lab um, so that it is a lot clearer for you and very understandable because uh, you may want to do this type of uh, uh, eye assessment on your patients, okay? So, um, um, I think that's a, a good um, kind of a summary of the important information um, from Monday's class. Um, obviously, we can't do the activities, but I kind of gave you a couple uh, little case studies or little scenarios. And again, um, we would normally have kind of done the patient-centered interaction in your Barbarita book on page two with Sophia Rodriguez. Uh, but uh, hopefully you can just review that on your own and uh, kind of determine um, uh, what the analysis kind of demonstrates in the dialogue. And um, I think it's also important, too, um, now with this, uh, with us doing assessments now, there will be some terms or medical terminology that may not be very familiar to you. So whenever you see a word that you're really not sure what it means, I would really highly suggest that you look up that word so that you can understand what that meaning is. Because we are going to chart according to proper medical terminology, you know. So it's very important that you know, um, uh, for instance, you'll see in the interaction with Sofia Rodriguez uh, that um, a word like presbyopia. Uh, what does that mean? And uh, I would hope that uh, after uh, you've gone over the reading and just looked at your assessments uh, with um, the face and the skull and the eyes and the ears and the nose and the mouth, that um, these terms will become a little more familiar to you. Uh, because these are the kinds of questions that you're going to see on that first test. Um, because uh, definitely sensory perception will be on that one. So, um, Again, um, there's uh, not much more than just the assessment uh, in lab, and I would highly suggest that you look on uh, week four in your modules, in your uh, Nursing 100 course, and view those videos that I've um, asked you to do. Uh, some of them aren't long at all. And then again, please review uh, that article um, about what happens as we age, um, you know, some of the sensory uh, changes that occur. So uh, I hope you have a great night, uh, and you should have time tomorrow to review this. Uh, it's a little less than uh, an hour, about 50 minutes, and hopefully it will direct you to uh, review some of the uh, readings that you can do on your own along with 
um, just kind of becoming familiar with some of the uh, terms that we'll be using uh, when we do assess uh, the face and the skull and the eyes and the mouth and the nose and the ears. So have a great evening and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.